Every day when you get in your car and you decide to drive your car, you get into that car and you activate that vehicle and you hardly ever even look at the gauges on the dashboard of it. Oh, you may glance at your fuel tank, which you should, or you may pay attention to the speedometer along the way. But rarely, unless one of those gauges alerts you, do you pay careful attention to what is happening? You see, the gauges that are on your vehicle, some of which you don't even understand, just like I would not understand, they're there to help you navigate as to how your vehicle is doing and what's going on in the internalities of that vehicle. And just as you enter a car and rarely pay attention to its gauges. This is even more true about your own personal life. You see, in your life, your life is filled with all kinds of gauges. And if you don't pay attention to what those gauges are telling you, you can end up in a situation that is not favorable to your life. We need to look at the dashboard of our own personal lives to determine what is going on within our lives. You see, a gauge is an instrument that helps you measure how you're doing. Whether that be for the simplicity of a vehicle or some electronic device, but even more so, it's important for your life. I believe personally that everything in your life and all that you are in your life has been created to bring glory to God. Everything. I believe that not one thing in your life is isolated from anything else. It all goes together. As I have lived life now a few years and I have observed Thousands and thousands of people live their own lives for a number of years. I'm telling you one of the greatest needs in lives today is teaching people how to check the gauges of their life. And over the next several weeks, we're going to teach you about checking the gauges of your life. We're going to use the Bible. We're going to seek after the Spirit to give us clarity. And we're going to evaluate ourselves personally. Let me say it this way to you. Over the next few weeks, through biblical exposition, Holy Spirit examination, and your own personal evaluation, you're hopefully going to be able to see where you are in some areas of your life. Now, I want you to really go deep on with me for a moment this statement that's up there now. Biblical exposition. Let me remind you that the Bible is all authoritative on everything. And when the Bible speaks, God speaks. Therefore, when He speaks, we need to listen and we need to obey. It's also important that we know the Holy Spirit is there to examine our lives. And what does he best do? He examines our lives in relationship to what the Scripture says and in relationship to Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, we want to compare ourselves with other people because it makes us feel better about ourselves. God doesn't compare us with other people. God compares us with His Son, Jesus. God compares us with His Word, the Bible. And so once we know what the Bible says about these areas of life and once we have the Holy Spirit in our lives examining us, we've got to evaluate ourselves personally as to how we're doing. 
In fact, over these next several weeks, we're going to challenge you to look at gauges that help you know where you are, listen carefully, spiritually. Where you are spiritually in your life. Where you are physically in your body. Where you are relationally in all of your relationships. Where you are financially. And where you are emotionally. Not one of those things is disconnected from another. And sooner or later, we have to stop long enough and pay attention to these gauges. Because listen, when these gauges start alerting you, it could have severe outcome to your situation. It's one thing to ignore your fuel gauge and you're on an interstate highway, bumper to bumper traffic, under construction, and there is no exit. But it is another thing altogether to have certain gauges going off in your life and all of a sudden, your whole life is transformed or lost because of it. So as I introduce this series to you today, I want to lay before you a couple of statements that are very important for you to remember. One you may have heard me say along the way, but I say it again today. As my spiritual life goes, so goes the rest of my life. Remember, I, I am not disconnected. I'm all together. I'm not just some blob that's been put together. God has, has created me for a purpose in my life. And I have to understand as my spiritual life goes, so goes the rest of my life. In other words, I cannot separate everything else going on in my life from my spiritual life. My spiritual life determines some of those matters, and those matters affect my spiritual life. There's a second statement, a very important statement in relationship to this series. I cannot determine how long I live, but I can determine how well I live. I, I cannot lengthen the days of my life. I, 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 it's not in my, my purview. It's not under my assignment to determine my length of days. But it is up to me to determine how well I live those days and how I live spiritually and physically and relationally and financially and emotionally will help upgrade those days or it will downgrade and lessen those days. So let me ask you today, how are you doing in your life? And how are you doing in your career? And how are you doing in your family? How are you doing in your future in relationship to where you are spiritually, where you are physically, where you are relationally, financially, and emotionally? I'm really convinced that Satan really does a number on our lives. He deceives us. He distorts the truth from us. He keeps us from certain realities that we always need to face. And you know what? Life is not a game. It never has been and never will be. And I declare these words to you that I really want to rock your life today. Life is a gift from God. Your life is a gift from God. Every breath, every moment, Everything you experience is a gift from God. Therefore, you better understand, you only have one shot with your life. You don't have two, you got one. Well, you say, well, I'm going to go to heaven one day. Yes, you will if you know Christ. 
But I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about now. You're not going to be reincarnated. I don't care what the progressives and the left tell you. Reincarnation is found absolutely nowhere in the Holy Scripture. You're not going to come back as a butterfly or a dog. This is your shot. So you better make it count. Make it count. And I say to you again, I cannot determine how long I live, but I can determine how well I do live my life. And so this morning, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to begin this series with a question, and this question is the title of the message today. On purpose or by accident? On purpose or by accident? Our text this morning is over in the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Remember, through biblical exposition, Holy Spirit examination, and personal evaluation, we're going to take a look today to see if your life is on purpose or just some accident. The Bible says these words in chapter 1 of Colossians in verse 15, and they're speaking of Jesus. He is, Jesus is, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. In the year 2002, a powerful, life-giving book was written. The book has now sold over 40 million copies. It's been read by presidents to paupers, movie stars to manual laborers, from corporate CEOs to capable workers. And the book is called The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. If you haven't gone through the book ever, you should. It takes about five or ten minutes a day. You read it, and it gives you 40 days where your life concentrates about purpose, living a purpose-driven life. If you've done it once, I went through the book again over the last few days and looking at various segments of it again. I've gone through it at least two or three times in my own life, but I've looked back through it, and boy, what statements fill this incredible book. In fact, Warren, in his opening sentence, absolutely captivates one of the most powerful statements that's probably been quoted as much as any book other than the Bible with his opening statement. The opening statement of his book is this, it's not about you. It's not about you. Tell your children that today and see what they think. It's not about you. And then Warren writes something like this. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. That's a pretty powerful statement, is it not? That your own personal fulfillment is really what life is not about. Your own peace of mind, your own happiness, that something else is going on, that the purpose of your life is far greater than that. 
Absolutely. Warren even makes a statement like this. You were born by his purpose and for his purpose. Sounds kind of biblical, doesn't it? Look at Colossians 1.16. Warren writes these words. You were made by God and for God, and until you understand that, life will never make sense. That is a profound statement. And then Warren declares this incredible insight. You are not an accident. <laughs> You're not an accident. You don't live in accident. God has created you for purpose and to live purpose. Talk about a mind-blowing thought. Look at this one. Long before you were conceived by your parents, you were conceived in the mind of God. Wow. Is that not amazing? And just one more that will challenge us all. But there is a God who made you for a reason, and your life has profound meaning. You believe that today? You believe all those statements today, or do you sit there and evaluate and question and analyze and scrutinize? And some of you even become quite critical or cynical even as you listen to them. Well, according to the Scripture in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, these words are true words, and these words are precise words. And they're words not only about Jesus Christ, and they're words not only about the earth and all of the heavens. It's not only words about the powers and about the authorities. It's not only words about any of those things, including the angelic beings, but these are words about your life. And listen to what it says. You were created by him and for him. You were created through him and for him. Look at it. Take it apart with me for a moment. Chapter 1, verse 15. He is the what? Image. Image of God. He is the image of God. He is the exact representation of God. The word image there is the, is the Greek word icon. It is where we get our English word icon. Jesus is the icon of God. He is the exact representation of God. He is God. He is God. He was not created to be God. He was already God. He is the beginning, and in him there is no end. He is the likeness of God. Remember what John chapter 1, verse 14 said when the apostle John declared, Jesus is God in the flesh, full of grace and full of glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That's who he is. He is the supreme God. He is exalted above all. He is above everything else in this world. And then this scripture makes this profound statement in verse 16. For everything was created by him. Did you read that? Everything was created by Jesus. This is, these are words about Jesus. And they were created by Jesus. What was created by Jesus? The heavens and the earth. What was created by Jesus? Everything that we see with our eyes? 
and everything that we do not see with our human eyes. We may see the clouds, but God knows what's behind the clouds. God created all of it. God created, the Bible says, even angelic ranks and spiritual powers, whether they be thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. And he even said that he is the firstborn of all, meaning he is supreme in rank and supreme in order, according to chapter 1, verse 15. And Jesus is supreme over all. Why is that that we believe that? Well, look at chapter 1, verse 16, the last phrase. All things have been created through him and for him. Not only the one who created all things, but God has created all things for himself. And look at this today. Not only is he the creator, but he is the goal of creation. He has created it for him, for his glory, for his fellowship, for his testimony to the rest of the world. God wants all of your lives to give him glory. You have been created for him, and this is where you fit in. Let me tell you where you fit in today. God created you, and you have been created by him and for him, through him and for him. You're not created for yourself. You're created for God. That's why life is not about you. That's why it's not about your preferences or mine. It's about God. In fact, I want you to imagine this with me for a moment. And I really want you to grab a hold of this today. Your existence is in Jesus. Your purpose is for Jesus. And only through Jesus will you become all God created you to become in your life. Oh, can you grab a hold of that today? Can you imagine the power of that statement? That's what Colossians 1, 15 and 16 is telling you. Your existence is in Jesus. And your purpose is for Jesus. And it's only through Jesus, only through Jesus will you become all God created you to become in your life. It's the only way. So I declare to you and I declare to the enemy today who might be listening in, you, my friend, are not an accident. You were not created by accident. You were created for purpose and on purpose. You were made by God, and you were made for purpose. You were created on purpose, and you were created for purpose. And I really believe personally that, that, that when you're living on purpose and you're living for purpose, you're going to believe a few things about your life that you normally would not believe. And I believe we need to review these things. We need to go over these things, not once, but again and again and again. You believe statements like this. I believe God has a purpose for my life. I mean, how do you read Colossians 1, 15 and 16 and then act like you're an accident? How do you read Colossians 1, 15 and 16 and then not sure that you have been created for purpose and on purpose, and you have a purpose. I believe God has a purpose for my life. Because when you believe these things, you will live with purpose. And when you believe the Scripture, you will know that you were made by God, and you were made for God, and you were not made just for yourself, because you're not. 
And there's a surprising but a truthful statement that I want to declare to you today, and I want you to really grab a hold of it in your heart today. You might ought to take it to work tomorrow and remind all your colleagues your purpose is far greater than a job far greater than a title, far greater than some human achievement. Let me say it to you this way. Stop reducing yourself to a job, a title, or some achievement. And stop devaluing human life by putting it on a job, a title, or some achievement. Because you may not always have a job, and you may not always achieve, and you may not ever have a title. So does that mean you're worth nothing to God? God's not into titles. God's not into jobs. God's not into achievements. God uses all those things to bring Him glory. And the power is in the glory of God. And so don't reduce yourself to that. Your purpose is through God, and your purpose is for God. And God's ultimate purpose for you is what? To make you more like Jesus Christ. And that's what life is all about. And guess what he does along the way? Along the way, he may use a job. Along the way, he may use a title. And along the way, he may use some human achievement or even a human failure that you went through in your life. There's a second statement, powerful statement. I will pursue God's purpose for my life. Are you pursuing God's purpose for your life? I think one of, the, one of the unique stories of the Old Testament is when God's people began to fall away from God. Now, God gave them chance after chance after chance to come back to him. God pleaded with them to come back to him. But they were choosing their own way, and they, they thought they knew more than God knew, and they forgot that they were created for purpose, and they just forgot there weren't God. And so, you know, sometimes God just lets people run their way or run their course and let sin run its course. And that's what he did. And guess where the people of God ended up? The vast majority of them were taken out of the homeland of what we would call Israel today, and they were taken into a country called Babylon. An ungodly country, a country that, that did not believe in the same God of the Jewish people. They went into this what is called captivity. In fact, it, they were placed in this country of Babylon. Therefore, the scripture calls it what? The Babylonian captivity. That's what historians call it as well. You know what's very interesting in all that is that in the middle of their captivity, after they had been there a year, and they were there how long? Seventy years. Before they were ever brought to the land of promise again. You know what God did? God told them something that some of you might even use as your life verse. He writes these words and says these words as written by Jeremiah. We know it to be in the 29th chapter, verse number 11. Do you remember the text? For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, but to give you a future and a hope. Now here they were, choosing their own way, away from the Lord, God let them have sin, run sin into his course. They find themselves in captivity, away from God. And God loves them so much, and God tells them, I know you're there and you're in it, but I'm telling you, I have plans for your life. I still have a plan for you. And these plans are not for you to be there. I've got a well-being for you. And my plans are not for your disaster, but these are plans that give you a future and plans that give you a hope. So pursue those plans. And God even told them all through chapter 29, you pursue the welfare of the city, you pursue the welfare of the country, and you pursue the welfare of your life. You live out my purpose even while you're away from me. And one day, I will bring you back. 
regardless of where you are in your life. You may feel you're in some kind of captivity, bound up, and even away from where God wants you to be. God loves you so much today that God is telling you, I have plans for your life. And I don't want you to see them. They're not disastrous plans. I have plans that are good, and they are for your well-being. And there's a third statement we need to believe. I love to talk about this statement because I believe that's where so many of us are. I believe nothing can hinder God's purpose for my life. I mean, do you believe that today, that nothing can hinder God's purpose for your life? I said it earlier. I'll say it again. I've lived life now a few years, and I have watched thousands and thousands of people live life. And here's what many people believe, including hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you here today. You believe God has sidelined you for something you've done in your past. You believe God has placed you on the bench. You believe that you cannot live out God's purpose due to some of the choices you've made in your past. To some of the sin that even you're choosing today. Some of you have been convinced by the enemy that you're too old or your education is too limited. And some of you are convinced you're too young. Some of you, due to circumstances, some of which are tragic and horrible, from the loss of a marriage to the loss of your credibility or reputation or large sums of money or a job, or some kind of tragedy in human life. You just wonder, what's the use? What's the use? I have little to add in life. I have little to give in my life. In other words, you're just telling God again and again by your words and your action, I'm on the sideline. I've been benched. Life has devastated me and I have nothing to offer. There is no one in all of Scripture that best represents this than a man named Job. Job lost his entire family in one day. Job lost all of his possessions. Job lost all of his health. Job had his friends come to him and tell him how bad he was and that he was experiencing all of that because he wasn't doing God's will. And yet the scripture says he was a man who had far, far great love for God and the highest reputation in all of the East. And he went through all of those losses. And on top of that, he lived with a woman who was his wife. That was good news. But this wife of his told him, son, you need to curse God and die. In other words, give up, dude. We got a bad life. And after all of those horrible, horrible circumstances that go on and on and on, there are 42 chapters in the book of Job. And all 42 tell the story. And if you read it very carefully, Job goes into this dialogue with God right before you get to the final chapter. And God tells Job some things that he needed to to know personally that's much more valuable than what his friends were telling him because they were telling him wrongly. And then the Bible declares these powerful words in the 42nd chapter, the last chapter. 
in the book of Job. In chapter 42, verse 1, it says what? It says, the Lord said, or the Job said this to the Lord. Look at what he said. Chapter 42, verse 2. I know that you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. Meaning, God, I know you can do anything you choose to do in my life, through my life, around my life. And it doesn't matter what the plan is, the bad plans of my friends toward me, the plans that that you may have for me. There is not one thing that anyone can ever do to thwart God's ultimate plan for my life. And I say to you today, in a powerful way, I believe that nothing can hinder God's purpose for my life. You have not been sidelined in your life. No, you have not. Those words thwarted or that word thwarted means that God was saying, Job was saying to God, God, there is not anyone, there is not any circumstance, there is not any tragedy, there is not any loss, there is not any reward, there is not any friend. There is not any bad choice in my life. There is not any sin that restrains or eliminates me from living out God's purpose. There is not one thing that shows that God's purpose has been clipped off of my life and I no longer have value. I've been cut off. I've been withheld. And nothing can hinder God's purpose for my life. And God was telling him, Job, you're not been on sideline. You've not been benched. I'm for you. And if I be for you, who can be against you? And Job said, you're right, God. You can do anything, anything. And no one can keep me from living out your plan. Friend, if that's true for Job, that's true for you. You stop believing the devil's lie. Some of you feel like because you did something wrong 20 years ago in your life, you are unworthy and you are guilty and there is nothing in the world God can do with you. Wrong. Some of you feel because of a lack of education or too much education, you're limited in your future. Because of your age or your stage in your life. Hogwash. God has a purpose for you. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, how healthy you are, how unhealthy you are, how much sin you have chosen in your past or what you're choosing today. If you will simply understand God has made you for him and unto his glory, my friend, it is there that you will discover no one can thwart God's purpose for your life. All leading to that fourth declaration, I will serve God's purpose in my generation. I will serve God's purpose in my generation. You know, David was commended by God of the Scripture, saying that he was a man who loved God with all of his heart. Yet, David made a lot of bad choices in his own life. King David did. But I think one of the most insightful verses in all of Scripture is found in chapter 13 of the book of Acts in verse 36, reflecting upon David. It says these words, For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep and was buried with his fathers, and he decayed. In other words, God says that Job lived out his purpose for his generation, and then he died And then he was buried, and then his body decayed, and one day the Lord will raise him up, even though his spirit is right now with the presence of the Lord. When you have served God's purpose for your generation, doesn't matter how long it is or how short it may be, we will die. We will be buried, and our bodies will decay. And one day God will raise our bodies up if we know Christ. You see, God determines my days. 
It doesn't matter how many miles I run a day. It doesn't matter what I eat or don't eat. It does not matter how my relationships are or how poor they may be. Or where I am in certain elements of my life. I cannot add days to my life. But I can do this. The days I have, I can determine how well I live for Christ. By all of the choices that I make spiritually and physically, relationally, financially, and emotionally. My friend, let me ask you, are you living out God's purpose for your generation? A lot of life we just don't understand. There's some people that live so long, they wonder, what in the world is God going to do with me? Why am I here? Well, I don't know the answers to that. But I know whether you are with a walker, on crutches, or in a wheelchair, or even on oxygen, or whatever your situation may be in your age or stage or vocation, as long as God has purpose for you, you're to live like you have a life to live, and you've got one shot with your life. So you give it your all. Because you're not an accident. You have been created for purpose in your life. And God created you to know his son, Jesus, who is the ultimate giver of purpose and of life. 